Okay. All right, let's get started here. Now, my aim in this first, in this third, rather, um, third address is to uh, be, I'm going to spend a little less time just in, in the presentation of material because I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. So this will be a little bit shorter, but I also want to cover a, a wide range of issues. One of the things about Luther that you realize if you start to read him is he's such an engaging writer. I mean, he's, he can be bombastic, he can be insulting, he can... But, 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 you know, he's always brilliant and insightful. Um, and so, and, so and, and, and he wrote on a, such a wide range of issues. And that was one of the things I wanted to start out by saying. If you think about the 95 Theses and the, the central concern that Luther had, it was really a pastoral concern that he had in the, in the 95 Theses. He was concerned about the way in which uh, ordinary people, so to speak, were, were being deceived or led astray or taken advantage of by the structures of the papacy. And he was being concerned about how they were led astray, both you know, playing off their spiritual concerns and, and concern for their family. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a window into part of the the, the, the genius of Luther uh, in God's, by God's grace. He was, on the one hand, this tremendously insightful, incisive, scholarly figure who's doing all kinds of high level for, for his day, research into the Bible. You know, a few years after this, after he's excommunicated, when he's in hiding, he translates the New Testament into German. Brilliant translation that's still used today. It's, it's sort of the... Uh, uh, equivalent of the King James Version in German. So people still are familiar with it. It's still used. So, so he has this, this brilliant intellect and this, this immense uh, intellectual capability, but, but also, and, 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 and you know, a big personality, but also uh, this consistent pastoral emphasis. He's, he's really thinking about the people to whom he's writing, to whom he's preaching, to whom he's speaking, and, and his concern from the very beginning is really for them, for their spiritual lives. And, that, and, I, and, I, and I say that by way of introduction to, to summarize the 95 Theses, and even I think the Heidelberg Catechism, or uh, rather the Heidelberg uh, uh, um, uh, Disputation, but, uh, but, but also as a kind of lead-in for what happens next. So, it, 1517, he posts the 95 Theses, early 1518, spring of 1518, Heidelberg Disputation. By the time you get to 1519, things have really heated up. And Luther now has reached a point, and I think, again, a lot of this happens after Heidelberg, has reached a point where he's not, um, he's not pulling his punches at all. So in 1519 in particular, he writes three books that are tremendously influential, uh, but are also somewhat inflammatory. I mean, he really takes on some of the central issues in the Roman church. He takes on the issue of marriage. He takes on uh, the, the idea of what the nobility should do and how they should protect their own people and in some sense protect their own people from the overreach of the church. And, and he writes on work as well and vocation. So, so these are things that he, he's, he's addressing to the people, but at this point, you know that he is, uh, he knows that what he's writing is going to get him into a lot of trouble. Uh, you can argue about the 95 Theses, whether he thought they would, they would create this big firestorm or whether he really was just trying to get into an honest discussion. That's arguable, I think, with, with, uh, in 1517. By 1519, I don't think it's arguable at all. He knows he's on kind of a fast track to... Um, excommunication. I don't think he relishes it because when it comes right down to it, when he's finally challenged and finally, um, you know, asked to recant, um, it, it does seem to really cause some angst in him. In, in, in his mind, the stakes are very high here. But nonetheless, I, th I think he recognized that what he was writing was going directly against the teaching of the church at that day. I think maybe he thought he would win, um, but but he certainly knew that someone was going to have to lose. 
uh, because what he was saying was, was in conflict with their teaching. So what I want to do now, instead of giving a kind of straightforward chronological account or even hitting some of the big events, I want to talk about several key issues that Luther wrote on that I think have bearing on our understanding today, and they were tremendously influential during his time. This is a little bit of a scattershot because there are any number of issues that, that Luther addressed, all of which are, were relevant in his day and many of which are still relevant today. But, but these were some of the big ones that I think are worth considering. So you get a sense of Luther's overall teaching since this is our last uh, session together. I want to begin by talking about uh, Luther's understanding of the, the life of the church and particularly the, the emphasis that he had on, on the Word of God and the centrality of the Word of God. You know, one of the things you see in the Reformation, this wasn't something that Luther instigated, but it was something that resulted in the, from the Reformation. You can see this in church construction. You can see that churches that were constructed pre-Reformation very often will have a kind of pulpit if you will, but it'll be off to the side. And one of the things you see in, in Reformation churches is, by and large, not all of them, but by and large, they move the pulpit right to the center of the church. And that was symbolic, but it was a, a, a very important kind of symbolism. Ulrich Zwingli, who, is, who was undertaking reforms at around the same time as Luther um, in Zurich, Switzerland, and, and later on in the, in the late 1520s, Zwingli and Luther clashed. They didn't like each other. Um, but, but, uh, but nonetheless, Zwingli was this great reformer. And, and, and one of the things Zwingli did that was so, uh, that was sort of his last step across the line to becoming a Protestant was he rearranged a lot of the, the, the furniture in the, in the church that he was charged with um, pastoring at the center of the city of Zurich. And one of the things he did was he took the, the, the communion table, the, the table that would be used for the Mass, and he moved it all the way to the back. So you really couldn't see it. It wasn't the central feature. And, and while he couldn't move the pulpit to the front because it's sort of in granite, um, he, he, uh, he, 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 he made the, the Word of God central even in the visual representation and he began to preach expositionally and he began to preach verse by verse through books and 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 he he he, 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 he uh, abandoned the church calendar and just made the word of god central so so luther was a part of that whole uh reform movement that was a central feature of the reformation that's why when we try to summarize reformation teaching one of the things that we start with is sola scriptura the bible alone when Luther is finally brought before this uh, sort of sham court that had been brought to, to, to get him to recant, uh, he, he uh, we don't know the exact wording of his speech because the records that we have are a little bit late, but he's reported to have said, look, as they lay all the books that he had written out in front of him and they say, are you going to recant or not uh, from what you've written? And, and he he basically says, look, my conscience is bound by the word of God. And if you show me in scripture where I've erred, then, then I'm willing to recant. But unless you can show me from the word of God that I, that I will not, then I will not recant from it. So he's, he's staking his theological claim, as it were, in uh, the scriptures. In his, in his commentary on Genesis where he, uh, that he writes later on, he, he talks about the power of the Word of God. And you can actually see this in Heidelberg when he talks about the love of God in that last thesis. But he talks about the Word of God not just being the vehicle for uh, explaining reality, but actually for creating, for, for doing a work of new creation. He talks about how in Genesis 1, from the first time we're introduced to the Word of God, God's Word is creating something. And that's what the Word of God does. It forms the people of God. And if you think about the Roman Catholic doctrine of, even today, the Roman Catholic doctrine of the church, they would say the church, the people of God, create the Word of God. The people of God are responsible for the Word of God. And in the Reformation, and in Luther in particular, he said, no, no, that's, that's exactly the opposite. It's the Word of God that creates the people of God. 
And, and it's the word of God that, that creates this, this community that, that we understand to be uh, the church of Jesus Christ. And what that means then is this, and this has profound implications for us today. What that means is if, the, if God's word is absent, then what you've essentially done, Luther would say, is you've taken God out entirely. And this, this does have um, significance for us because if you think about when you are, are evaluating the health of a church or when you're trying to give someone advice about what to look for in a church, uh, we always need to say, well, God's word has to be present. It's one of the great marks of the church that the word of God is faithfully proclaimed. And, that, and, and it gets proclaimed through the sacraments as well. That's in a sense... Uh, 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 an, an implication of the Word of God being central. But God's Word is what God uses to create those, um, those who uh, 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 will, will please Him. It's interesting because Luther took this so seriously that he actually gets himself into some strange theological conundrums. At one point, he's ex, uh, expositing Paul's words in Romans 10 where Paul says, Faith comes by hearing hearing the word of Christ. And Luther has this extended discourse. It's, it's sort of strange to us today, um, but he has this extended discourse questioning whether, whether people who have lost their hearing can actually be saved. Um, and, he's so, and, 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 you know, there's, there's a sense of absurdity to that, um, and we would, you know, pretty quickly dismiss that concern. But, 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 you, uh, but you can see in, in his whole wrestling with that just how seriously he took the hearing and preaching of the Word of God. It was that important. He thought that's what God uses. God's Word says that He uses uh, the Word to create the people of God. And then he has this very um, famous saying that, uh, that, that's often quoted when, when he's asked a little bit later on about the Reformation. Someone says, well, you know, what were you doing? What did you do to make this happen? And... Uh, and Luther responds by saying, you know, we didn't do anything. While, while we, uh, Melanchthon and I, sat in, in, in Wittenberg and drank our beer, the Word did it all. Um, in other words, he's looking back at that, that you know, 15-year period of time where Europe was totally transformed. And Luther says, I, I didn't have anything to do with that. All I did was release the Word of God. And, and God did it. Now, of course, Luther was tremendously active and he worked hard to release the word of God and he even worked hard to make sure it got in everybody's hands. But, but the, the, there, is something, there is something profound about that. We're just sitting in Wittenberg doing our thing, drinking our German beer, and, and, and God's word does its work. Um, that's how he, he saw it. He talks about the way in which the word of God was not only to be proclaimed in the church... And, and, and it was so central in the church. And actually, in the Reformation churches that Luther ends up having to organize because nobody knows what to do now that they've broken from the Roman Catholic Church, what he, what he encourages pastors to do is to have more services of preaching. Because what he says, is pe what people need fundamentally is more of the Word of God. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Because our, our culture, even our church culture, Gen generally is going in exactly the opposite direction. We want, we want less word. We want fewer obligations to sit under sound biblical preaching. But Luther said, no, no, that's, this is exactly what you need. What, what the people need, if they're going to be instructed, if they're going to grow, if God's going to create, if God's going to do what he does in gathering a people to himself, it, the word of God needs to be proclaimed. So even in terms of evangelism, if you ask Luther, how, what should I do to cause the church to grow? Uh, you know, what people would tell you today is to preach shorter sermons and to do less and to um, make the entry bar as low as possible. What Luther would say is you need to get the word out there more because it's God doing the work and he does his work, we know, through his word. Now, when it came to him personally, he also has some beautiful statements about uh, how the word of God works in our lives devotionally, and particularly uh, he, he focused here on the Psalms. Remember, the Psalms were the first book that he taught as a professor of, a, uh, of Bible, and, and he spent 1513 through 1515 lecturing on the Psalms, 
And it really changed his view of God in so many ways. But it also changed his view of the Christian life. Um, he, he, cry, he, he uses David as an example. Whenever David is uh, uh, um, in trouble, he, he cries out to God using these very simple words. And then what, what, what Luther saw in the Psalms was David then not only reminds himself of the Word of God, but sings the Word of God and prays the Word of God. And that becomes part of his, the workings of his heart. He has this beautiful little letter, Luther does, that he writes to his friend, Peter the Barber. Um, they, they, that was how they uh, denoted uh, which Peter it was. It was Peter the Barber. And um, actually, actually, Peter the Barber's story is, is really something. He later on actually commits um, murder, but, and he's, he's tried for murder. But in any case, at this point, he writes to Luther and asks him a question about, about his his prayer life. Luther, how, I, I find prayer so difficult. Um, I, I find that I barely pray at all. What do you suggest? And Luther has all kinds of advice, but here's what he says. When I feel I have become cool and joyless in prayer because of other tasks or thoughts, I take my little psalter, little book of Psalms, hurry to my room, or if it be the day or the hour for it to the church where a congregation is assembled, because now they're meeting a lot to hear the word of God. And as time permits, I say quietly to myself and word for word the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and if I have time, some words of Christ or of Paul or some Psalms. And then he says, I do this just as a child might do. So what Luther's saying is this, when I'm, when I'm overly busy or when I find myself disconnected or distant from God I'm not praying as I ought to what do I do I just I just go back to the basics of reminding myself of the teaching of scripture just reciting these basic things that I know to be true and he has his little psalter with him so he's reading through the psalms uh, for his devotions and, and it's, it's again it's a good reminder that this great reformer although the Lord was using him to turn Europe upside down and he was by far the best-selling author in Europe, as I mentioned earlier, is, is still a man who's struggling with his Christian life and struggling to grow in grace and struggling in communion with God. And he doesn't have some advanced answer to that uh, problem. He doesn't have some special trick. What he does is just the basic things that we would want to tell everyone to do as Christians, which is you know, remind yourself of what the Bible says. Read your Bible. Pray. Get to a quiet place. Pray to the Lord with your Bible open. So that's, that's, those are some of the things he says about the Word of God. It's creative power and then the way in which it works to, uh, to even change our own life if we just simply fill our minds with the Word. You know, this is a later uh, reference, but later on, several hundred years later, uh, when we talk about the, the Puritans in England, uh, one of the Puritans, John Bunyan, uh, someone asked to, uh, for a description of him, and they said, you know, he had just the Bible coursing through his veins. In fact, they said, if you, if you cut him open, he would bleed Bibline. He, he had, you know, Bible. It was just Bible all the way through. And what a great picture that is. That's essentially what Luther's saying. You want to bleed Bibline. You want... Bible coursing through your veins. And if you have trouble with prayer, go to the Bible and remind yourself of these truths. And, and certainly, if you're in any kind of position of oversight and leadership in the church, you want the Bible just governing everything, every decision you make, every, every sermon you preach, every, everything you do, how you act towards one another. It's all Bible, Bible, Bible. And, 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 if, you're, and if you're not in a position of leadership, that's the kind of place you want to be. And you want to promote more and more teaching of God's Word because God uses His Word uh, to do His work and, and particularly His work in creation and new creation. Now, switching gears a little bit, let's talk uh, about some of Luther's insights on um, the, the civil magistrate. Um, I told you that this was one of the books he wrote early on after Heidelberg that was most, uh, or this was one of the topics he tackled. He wrote a number of books on it. Uh, one of the topics he tackled in that key 1519 year that got him into quite a bit of trouble. And, and the reason it got him into so much trouble was because he, um, 
he was clear in articulating something that was actually in the church's teaching already going way back to um, Augustine, but he, uh, he revives this Augustinian notion that had largely been lost. And that was this notion, uh, uh, St. Augustine wrote uh, this uh, very important work called City of God. And in, in City of God, he's responding to the, the, the destruction of Rome, the fall of Rome, and he he, he talks about the fact that there are, there's, there's a, a city of man that manifests itself in different ways in different times. You have, you know, the Babylonian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, these other great cities of man. But, but there's always a city of man out there. And then, but then what he, he shows, starting all the way back in Genesis, he traces the fact that there's also the city of God within the city of man. And that city of God within the city of man is... Uh, is, is, is really where the action is because God's at work with the, in, in the midst of the rise and fall of empires to build his church. Now, Luther takes some of those notions. He was an Augustinian after all. He takes some of those notions and he applies them maybe a little more directly than Augustine himself applied them to the, these spheres or kingdoms in which um, people lived. There's a, there's a civil sphere And then there's also uh, the the church itself. And the church has a kind of uh, a a, a certain sphere of authority, but but so does the civil authority. And that these are to work in concert with each other, and and, and both Christians are citizens of both of these and need to exist in both of these. And as he teased that out, um, what became clear was one of the things he was taking aim at was the Pope's overriding and over kind of overarching ambition to be ruling over all of uh, life in Europe. So the Pope, again, remember the quote I, I, I gave last night uh, from Innocent III, where he talked about the Pope being like the sun and, and these other kings being like a moon. And, and what they need to do is get close to the sun because, because the sun is really what provides the light, the truth. Uh, and Luther, Luther actually elevated the degree to which the civil magistrate has a particular role in society. And it might be a role that's not um, identifiable with the role of, of church leadership. And he, he makes a distinction between temporal authority and spiritual authority. And he also challenges the Pope's monopoly on the interpretation of, of the Bible. Along with that, though, he, he answers some questions which were fairly profound questions at that time. He, he writes a, a little, uh, a wonderful little pamphlet called, Can Soldiers Too Be Saved? And it was in response to a question he'd received from someone who said, Look, I'm, I'm a soldier. I'm, I'm almost exclusively devoted to the civil sphere. And in fact, I'm devoted to the civil sphere in a way that requires me to do violence against others. Is it even possible for someone like me? to be a Christian at all. And and in answering that question pastorally, Luther sort of unfolds how it is that we need to live our civil lives and yet also live our civil lives as Christians, as as members of Christ's church. And that, that distinction was very murky at that time. And it was murky because... Um, there was not only, not only be, because the Pope wanted this high degree of authority over almost all spheres of life, but there was also this idea that had crept in that suggested that, that spiritual work, church work, was, was really much, much higher, much more godly than work in the civil sphere. So Luther wrote a, what became one of his most controversial books called An Appeal to the German Nobility. And I want to read this quote because this, I think, captures what he's trying to say. It is a pure invention, he says, that pope, bishop, priests, and monks are called to a spiritual estate while princes, lords, artisans, and farmers are called to a temporal estate. This is indeed a piece of deceit and hypocrisy. All Christians, if they're true Christians, all Christians are truly of the spiritual estate. And there's no difference among them except that of office. And 
And, and what Luther is trying to do there is to take aim at two, uh, two misconceptions. One, on the part of those in the church who were saying, look, we're the ones who are really doing something spiritual, and all of you are kind of dispensable and disposable, and, and not really even close to uh, uh, the level that we're attaining. And, and you need to listen to us and everything. And then, and then that had a ripple effect on the other side, which is the people who were artisans or princes or, or, or whatever level of, of society they were in, um, weren't sure exactly how their role was spiritual at all. Uh, in what way is what I'm doing even, does, does, is what I'm doing of any spiritual value? And one of the things you see coming out of the Protestant Reformation, whether it be in Germany with Luther or in Geneva with Calvin, is this tremendous elevation of the work that people who were not in the, not officers in the church were doing. So if you, if you make shoes, Luther would say, you make shoes to the glory of God. If, you, if you're called to be a prince, if that's the status and station that the Lord's given to you, well, you rule your people and you rule them to the glory of God in obedience to God. And, and that, is, that is a spiritual work. Now, Luther's not trying to, in, in, he's not trying to uh, uh, set aside the work of the church at all as if that's something unnecessary. No, in fact, he elevated that and he recruited all kinds of people to serve in the church and he himself spent his time serving in the church but he is saying to people who were Christians, the work you're doing matters. And, and the work you're doing, because God has called you to it, because God has placed you in that station, because it's what God has given you to do, that work has tremendous, even spiritual significance. Now, what that, what that ends up doing in Europe as a consequence is it ends up meaning that those people who are shoemakers, who are in, in those kinds of civil roles. Even soldiers or, or, or whatever uh, governmental officials uh, might be there, they, they actually end up taking their role more seriously. Because if you, if you believe that, look, making shoes is, is something I'm doing to the glory of God, and I, 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 need, I need to take that seriously, and I need to take my Christianity seriously as I'm making shoes and interacting with people as a merchant, then... Then, then you're going to do that differently. It's going to affect your, your whole perspective. And so what we actually see is, in elevating those roles, Luther, Luther is used by God to transform uh, society. Another quote that I'll say, uh, just to kind of summarize it is, he says, everyone must benefit and serve every other by means of his own work or office, so that, so that in this way, many kinds of work may be done for the bodily and spiritual welfare of the community, just as all the members of the body serve one another. Now, that may just sound obvious to us, but it was radical at the time that Luther said it and wrote it. And it was actually also in the mind of the Roman church, it was a way of undercutting their authority. Because if what he's doing is spiritual work, and, and, and if he can do that work to the glory of God in such a way that it's actually pleasing to God what he's doing, then, 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 then I no longer have this grip, this kind of corner, this monopoly on what is spiritual and what is godly. So Luther, Luther's teaching revolutionized work. I want to give one more area where Luther's teacher, teaching was revolutionary and then we'll take some time for questions. Luther wrote extensively and actually quite profoundly on the institution of marriage and of the family. Now Luther himself, of course, being a monk, was unmarried for some time. Even after he was excommunicated from the church, he really didn't, wasn't interested in getting married. Although, interestingly enough, his father, who was still in the picture, uh, wrote to one of his close friends and said, You've got, to, you've got to find him a wife. Uh, his, he, he had actually, the Augustinian monastery in Wittenberg, after the, the uh, Luther's excommunication and after the Reformation kind of got going, um, became his house. Uh, you could visit it today. It started out as a monastery, but it was his house, and it was a mess, and he had, couldn't, couldn't 
you know, keep himself fed and, and couldn't keep track of money. And it was, it was, his life was just in, in sort of chaos. And that's why his dad said, you know, somebody's got to got to find him a wife and eventually and, but, but what was also happening was this uh, this is in the mid uh, 1520s what was also happening is all these monasteries that had previous and, and and nunneries as well that had previously been under vows of celibacy these these people came to protestant convictions and because they came to protestant convictions they came to certain convictions about the goodness of marriage and, and so what you actually had, and it's an interesting, almost humorous side of Luther's administrative life. He had a lot of administrative things going on as he's trying to build the church in Germany. But he also is dealing with all these newly single adults who were previously monks or nuns. And Luther is sort of matching them up. And he'd have, he'd have nuns arrive at what was now his home, but used to be the Augustinian monastery, and just say... You know, there's eight of us here. Find us husbands. Um, and, and Luther would try. I mean, he would try to do that. And actually, a lot of his friends, he, he married to, to, to former nuns. And eventually, um, that's what happened with him. He married uh, a, a woman who had been a nun and had ha had a vow of celibacy, but then uh, came to Protestant convictions. And she was, she was pretty sure that she was the right person to marry him. He wasn't so sure, but... Eventually, they, they were married, and it was a great blessing to Luther's life. So, but Luther had already written about it before he actually was married himself. In, fi in that 1519, that, that really tumultuous year, he wrote a book called On the Estate of Marriage. And, and this, too, again, it may seem, it may seem very uh, obvious to us, but it was a radical book in so many ways. He basically said marriage is given by God for the purpose of lifelong friendship and the, and the blessing of children. And, 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 and he elevated the estate of marriage. Now, what that meant was, of course, in the, in the Roman church at that time, if you, were spirit, if you were really spiritual, that is, if you're working in the church, and he's already sort of dealt with that, but if you're really spiritual working in the church, then that also means you can't be married because to be married is a, certain, a sort of second-class citizenship. And Luther said, no, actually, if we look at the scriptures, it's elevated and it's honored by God, and it serves all kinds of purposes. He, he does uh, an exposition of Genesis to show that. In fact, he says this in that book. Um, above, uh, He's talking about all these various loves in which, which God has given us in our lives, and he says, but above all these is married love. All other kinds of love seek something other than the loved one. This kind wants only to have the beloved's self completely. So what Luther's saying as early as 1519 is the teaching that the church is giving about marriage, which is kind of a necessary evil for people who aren't really spiritual and in the church, is no, actually, according to the scriptures, it's the highest kind of human love or kind of expression of human love, and it's to be held in honor by all. He was realistic about it, though. Later on, he got even more realistic after he got married, um, as often happens. He, uh, he, he, he talks about uh, the first year of marriage after he himself is married in the 1520s. He says, uh, you know, the, the man has strange thoughts in a first year of marriage. Um, and, 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 and he talks about being really busy with all kinds of stuff. And, and he says, uh, uh, what wives bring to their husbands, no matter how busy they may be, a multitude of trivial matters. And, what he's, he's and he describes sitting there, you know, trying to get work done. And here comes his wife just bringing up all kinds of trivialities with him. But he describes it in a way that's very, uh, it's, not, it's not critical, it's not, it's not mean-spirited. It, it, there's just a kind of realism about how he describes the early lives uh, of marriage. Um, he says, uh, you know, <laughs> he has this great, great quote, um, he said, if, if when you're married, at, from time to time you murmur and snap at one another, uh, there may be no harm in it. And then he says, in a marriage, things are not always straightforward. Now that's the, that's the voice of someone who's, who's been married at that time and, and who writes on it. And he really writes on it for, his, for uh, the rest of his, his life. Um, he talks about pastors dealing with marriage matters. And he says this to the pastors in Germany. How much trouble do we have with marriage matters alone? What hard work it is to get people together. 
and how much greater a care it is afterwards to keep them together. And so he's realistic about the challenges of marriage, but nonetheless holds up the value of marriage in a way that really stood in distinction to those of his day. Now, his own wife basically, from a human perspective, rescued Luther. She, she, she got him on a, a healthier diet. She organized their home. They had a number of children. They were able to have guests in their home. You know, his, his checks weren't always bouncing. I mean, just in all kinds of ways, she, she changed his life uh, for the better. Um, and, and, and particularly when it came to children, uh, Luther always elevated the, the role of children. He, um, he, he suffered the loss of his daughter, and he writes very movingly about that. He also gathered with his children every day and engaged in what we may call devotions or family worship with them and was always intrigued by the questions they would ask. He, he said this at the end of his life, uh, he said, there are only two works of mine that deserve to be reprinted after my death. Now, of course, almost everything that Luther's written that we have access to is, is still in print today. But he said there were really only two things that should be reprinted. One was uh, a book called On the Bondage of the Will, uh, which was actually a response to a, a book written by Erasmus called The Freedom of the Will. But uh, The Bondage of the Will, it is a powerful book about... Uh, our, our nature as fallen sinners. And then, and then the second thing he said that should be reprinted, that deserved to be reprinted even after he died, was his children's catechism. He wrote this beautiful question and answer for children. And it's, it, sometimes you can tell, you know when you're looking at, at, at children's material and you think to yourself, I'm not sure this person ever met a child in, in their life. Um, this just doesn't work. Um, but, but, but Luther's children's catechism really isn't that way. It's, uh, it, you can tell that, it, that he's, he's interacting all the time with children and their questions and their misunderstandings and, 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 and speaking to them in a way that's very uh, profound. So if we take a step back and think about these emphases, um, we could ask ourselves a few questions today, 500 years uh, on the other side of Luther. We could ask ourselves the question about our churches. How central in the life of your church is the preached word and is the word in general? And then, and then when you move from your church to your own self, is this, is this what you go to over and over again in order to know God and even grow in your love for Him and your prayer to Him? Does your, does your devotional life center around the word of God? Well, Luther would say it must if it's going to be uh, biblical. And uh, another question we could ask is this. If you're, if you're a Christian, how do you view the work that you do? Um, for most people, mo the vast majority of Christians, they're not, they're not ordained and set apart for the work of as elders or deacons in the church. They're not, that's, not, that's not how they're making their living, so to speak. And, uh, and, and, and Luther would say, are you thinking about that in a Christian way? Are you doing whatever it is that God's given you to do to the glory of God? And are you recognizing other Christians who are doing those same things to the glory of God? All your work matters, Luther would say, and what you do at work and in your home matters as well. I would also say this. This is, this is helpful particularly when you think of Luther's understanding of the family. There's so much to learn from Luther's understanding of the family. But Luther would say this to those who are invested in their families. Uh, mothers and fathers who are taking care of uh, young children in particular, uh, he would say that is, that is among the greatest exp earthly expressions that, that God has given us, both of displaying love and also of serving Him. Sometimes I'll meet people when I'm traveling. Um, oftentimes it's, it's moms of young kids, and they say, I wish I could do more ministry. I wish I could get involved in this and that, but I just I can't. I've got so much going on with my home. And I think Luther would tell us, and the Bible would tell us ultimately, that no, no, that's, that's, that, is, that is exactly the spiritual calling, the primary spiritual calling that the Lord has given you to do right now. And, and you need to do it to the glory of God, and God is, is pleased um, as you do. Uh, sometimes people can wonder whether what they do Monday to Friday matters to God. Luther was emphatic about the fact that it did matter, and it was very relevant. And, and in so doing, he really transformed 
people's understanding of the spiritual life. So, a profound thinker. I, I always feel at the end of these, like we're just barely scratching the surface. And you could, you could do a lifetime of study on Luther and really never get to the end of him. He's a fascinating figure um, and, and uh, an engaging one, but, but one that I think challenges so many of our um, ideas even today. So I'll, I'll stop there because I did promise to give some time for questions. And so this should give us a little bit of time if there are any questions that you have or comments. Yes, sir. You mentioned the civil authority in, in the church uh, at that time. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a consideration uh, of the situation as well. But particularly, did Luther have any particular views on common grace? Uh, and, yeah. I, th I think we can put some of those categories on top of him, but those weren't generally the categories he talked in. I mean, th so, so that, under, that sort of later reformed idea, expression of common grace, isn't usually the language he used. But, but I think if you mapped them, you could, you could see a lot of similarities there. So yes and no. I mean, I think there's, there's, again, a lot of similarity between our discussion of common grace today and what Luther himself said. But that's not, the, that's not the label he was drawn to as much. I, I, I have to think through whether how much he uses that label, but it, it, my impression is not, not too much. That's not, that's not his primary category. Yes, sir? On the whole concept of purgatory, yeah. did they believe that so when you die, it would just be a matter of time before you were ready to uh, be with God? It was it just a matter of, uh, you know, that you could work your, work through your um, salvation. Yeah. It just was a matter of uh, hundreds or thousands or hundred thousand years or something. Yeah. Is that how they thought yeah, about it? Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, it would it could depend on a whole lot of things. It could depend on people praying for you now. That's why even today you'll see in Roman Catholic churches they'll pray for the dead. The hold masses for the dead, a memorial for the dead. It's 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 you're praying for these people who are going through this really torturous experience. Um, yeah, essentially though, it is a matter of time. I mean, purgatory is an ante room to heaven, so you are headed in the right direction when you're there. But when you read the descriptions of it, it sounds an awful lot like hell, um, just because it's of the of the torture and fire that it involves. But yeah, essentially it's a matter of time, but I mean, we could be talking a really, really long time. And if you were like a bishop or something, was it was just a matter of, for, for that person, it would just be a shorter period yeah, of time? That's, than the <laughs> that's right. Very, there were very few people that they thought were immediately translated into heaven. Um, and, and so yes, the ideal would be if you were more spiritually elevated you, you wouldn't need as much purging afterwards. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, would you comment on uh, Luther's uh, anti-Semitism? Sure, yeah. That's a, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a, it's a troubling feature. Um, so, so here's what you find when you look at Luther's comments on the Jewish people. In the 1520s, he actually writes... Um, one of the more pro-Jewish books that you'll find in the 1500s. Um, uh, it's entitled, Jesus Christ Also Was a Jew. And so it's, it's trying to show the continuity between the Jewish people and, and Christianity. And, it, and it's, again, if you had that book alone, you would say Luther actually stands out, not for his anti-Semitism, but for his... Uh, beautiful embrace in so many ways of, of, of Jewish people. But uh, I, I, something happens uh, in the next decades, and I don't know that we, I don't know entirely how to piece it together, but um, later on, nearer to his death, he writes some horrific things um, that were actually even lifted, quotes were lifted from them and used at, at the time of not in Nazi Germany. I mean, Luther, of course, is part of German heritage and German history. And uh, on the Jews and their lies uh, w uh, was one title. So um, what, how do you explain the change? Um, 
Well, so first of all, I'm not excusing any of it. I'm not excusing some of the things he wrote, which I think are indefensible. But um, I would say this. I think just as a matter of explanation, two things changed with Luther in those intervening decades. One, when he writes, um, Jesus Christ also was a, was a Jew in, in the 1520s, I really think he believes that the Reformation is, was a revival by God, and God was doing this tremendous work, and I, and I believe he was right about that. But Luther thinks that that's going to basically encompass and lead to the conversion of Jewish people in Europe. And so he's very optimistic about the conversion of the Jews. Uh, and, and what happens when you get a little later on in his life is it just didn't take place at all. Um, very, you know, almost almost no evidence of Jewish conversion during that time. And so Luther, that, that certainly affects him uh, because he, he had this optimistic view of Jewish ingathering and then realizes it's not going to happen. The other thing is, and this is again not an excuse and not in, not in any way, so don't, under, don't misunderstand it, but the truth of the matter is it's just a fact. The last 10 years of Luther's writings have a very different character and a much harsher character partly because I think he'd been through a lot, partly because if, if I were to read for you uh, a description, especially your doctor, uh, if I were to read for you a description of what Luther's uh, health issues were like, um, it's somewhat, it's grotesque, and it's appalling, and it's brutally painful. That's true of a lot of people in the Middle Ages at his age who ate the way he ate and drank the way he drank, but it was just what it was. And, 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 and you just get the sense in the last five or ten years of his life, he was just perpetually in a bad mood. Um, not an excuse, okay? Don't, don't, I'm not making light of it. I'm just saying it really is, it really is the case. And so, um, you know, you know that, that's, that's all I can really say. I can't say anything by way of defense. I can just say, but I, but I do think it's worth noting that in the 1520s, he wrote very differently about the Jewish people. So it isn't, I don't think you could say, well, you know, this is what happens when you give people a Bible, they end up coming to these terrible conclusions. That's not what happened. When Luther was reading his Bible, he actually came to very different conclusions. Yes? So, I know you said you don't know what happened between the uh, 95 Theses and the Heidelberg Disputation. Yeah. But amongst Luther's scholars, are there some ideas or hypotheses of, like, did he encounter some writings or was this an outworking of things he had been chewing on for a long time? What are people speculating? You know, I'm not, I'm not aware of a, a lot of answers on that in, in, the, in the scholarship. Um, one of the issues that makes it tricky is, I, I mentioned earlier that Luther writes a kind of spiritual autobiography and he talks about this moment where he beat importunately on Paul's words in Romans 1, the just shall live by faith, and the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. And so he's just like hitting, I'm, I'm hitting my head against it, is what he's saying. And, and finally, I realized it's God granting righteousness through faith to those who are in Christ um, and who are justified by faith. The problem is, so, so then he says, I, I felt as if I was born again. And so it's, it's really easy, and I think probably correct, to zero in on that moment and say, see, that's what happened. That's how Luther was converted. The problem is, the problem is Luther, in his sequence of events, puts that around 1519. So after Heidelberg and after the 95 Theses. So it would be, it would be really convenient if Luther had said, I was beating my head importunately on Romans 1, on Paul's words, between 1517 and early 1518, but he doesn't say that. So this, most of the scholarship about you know, Luther's transformation, and everybody acknowledges there was a transformation that took place in Luther's thinking. Everybody knows that. The question is, when did it happen? So you have some people who say, well, he mentions Romans, so maybe it happened when he was teaching Romans. And then he was kind of converted before even 1517 when he nailed the 95 Theses. There are, you know, that may be, I don't know. Um, but, but Luther puts it later even than, even than Heidelberg. So there's not a whole lot of 
clear evidence of what was happening in his mind. Most of what we have about Luther between October of 1517 and May of 1518 is the negotiations with Rome about safe passage to Heidelberg and, and then, and then the, the kind of pushback that he's receiving from the theses, the 95 theses. So I, I just don't know that we know. If, if I, you know, if I were, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I've said it, I, I, I think some, something significant happened right there, right in, those, in that window. And, and I, would, I would, if Luther had put his sort of conversion right in there, that would make sense to me, but he didn't. Can you explain the concept of what led Luther to believe in trans transubstantiation? Well, he denied transubstantiation. He denied, he denied that the body and blood, or, or that the, the, the bread and wine actually become uh, the, the body and blood, but, but he, he tried to take a kind of middle ground. He did disagree with almost all the other reformers um, who, who took a even further view from transubstantiation, but you know, so a lot of times theologians will say, and Luther himself would have said, it, it, it was something like consubstantiation. So he believed that he was, that Christ was on, around, underneath. Um, he used all these um, prepositions to describe the presence of Christ, but not actually the, the bread and the wine. Um, so, so his view was different from the Roman church's view. Um, as he began to articulate it. But it was also different from the mainstream reformed view that we see in Zwingli and Calvin and others. Uh, some people would say Zwingli and Calvin had different views, but putting that aside, it, it, Luther's is certainly different from both of them. Um, and that was actually a key point in, in, uh, there was, there was in the late 1520s, in 1529, um, these major reformed leaders, um, Protestant leaders, got together in Marburg and attempted to try to unite all these churches. So there's a German version that's kind of led by Luther, and there's a you know Zurich version that's led by Zwingli, and and they were going to try to bring them all together. And so there'd be one Protestant church. Um, and, and they weren't able to do it largely because of Luther's disagreement with everybody else on the nature of the, the Lord's Supper. So not, I wouldn't say transubstantiation, but it's, it's closer. It's closer. So there's a lot of uh, books written on Luther, a lot of biographies. Um, what would you... What are one or two, or however many you want to list, uh, yeah. your favorites? Maybe also even um, books on the Reformation. There's tons right. there, too. So. Good. Uh, so on Luther, two good ones to start with. Uh, there's an, a somewhat older one by Roland Baton um, called Here I Stand. And it is, you know, there are modern scholars who would quibble with various parts of his portrayal. And, and, I, and I'm not saying they're wrong that they may be right, but, but it's still, generally speaking, reliable and good, and it's by far the most readable and accessible. It reads like a novel. I mean, it's just a fantastic book. So if you want to start anywhere, I would start there. And, and the historical details that people quibble with, you can, you know, you can sort through that. Uh, so it may not be the most up-to-date, it's not the most up-to-date scholarship on Luther, but it is it is maybe still the best starting place. Another book I would recommend is called Luther on the Christian Life by Carl Truman. It's not a biography per se, although you'll read, you'll learn biographical details in it. But what, what, what Truman deals with is a lot of, he'll, he'll unpack in much greater detail a lot of the things I was talking about in this final session. What Luther said about work, what he said about the family, what he said about the Christian life. And that's a good way of sort of summarizing Luther's pastoral teaching and the implications today. So if you're intrigued by Luther and you want to learn, you know, what does he have to teach me? Um, Luther on the Christian life, I think, is a really good place to start. There are dozens of really good Luther books, but those are two that spring to mind that are very, both very accessible. Um, on the Reformation as a whole, uh, that's a good question because what, 
you know, we didn't, we, I just barely alluded to this, but you could probably tell from a few things I said, even just about the Marburg colloquy, there's a lot going on throughout all of Europe. Luther's not the only story. Uh, in fact, even though he's the one who's most identified with the beginning of the Reformation, around the same time, Zwingli is reforming the church in Zurich, and Zwingli said that he didn't even know about what Luther was doing. May or may not be true, but, but he didn't, you know, it's not directly connected with Luther. And then pretty quickly in the 1520s, it just goes all over Europe. And so you have all different cities in, in France and Germany uh, and elsewhere that are, that are reforming. And so it's re I say all that to say, to talk about the Reformation, there are a lot of Reformations happening. And they all have similar themes and similar ideas behind them, but it's a, it's a vast subject. So because of that, the books that are the best are, are pretty, pretty vast. I mean, you could even extend that to say in, in, the, in the 1530s, the, the, the church in England is reforming, and it's totally different. I mean, it's top-down, and it's because of, you know, this marriage that, that King Henry wants to dissolve. But, but also William Tyndale's been there, and they've got a New Testament. So anyway, it's a complex subject. It's usually easier to address individual parts of the Reformation, like Luther. But um, on the Reformation, I, you know, there's a, there's a multi-volume church history by Nick Needham, and one of the volumes, I think it's volume three, is on the Reformation. It's very accessible. I, 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 might, I might not be right that it's volume three. You, you have to check, but it'll say in the subtitle. Um, and, uh, and it's really accessible, and it will kind of give you a sense of the breadth without bogging you down with all kinds of details. So Nick Needham's church history is really good, um, and, uh, and it's um, it particularly volume on the Reformation. There's a... There's a book by Michael Reeves called Unquenchable Flame and it's about the theology of the Reformation and it gives a summary of a lot of what was but it, and it's a really short little book so that's a good book that I think grasps um, the essence of of what was happening pretty well and applies it so those are two that come to mind but like I said the hard part is the ones that are the best are usually big books because they're dealing with like you know several different countries and a number of different figures. If you want to read more about Zwingli, um, there's an excellent biography by Bruce Gordon that was just published um, in the last year, year and a half, called, I don't know, it has Zwingli, it's all Ulrich Zwingli, and, and, and there's a subtitle, I forget what the subtitle is, but Bruce Gordon is a, uh, a historian at Yale University. So anyway, that, that's maybe a starting place. And if, you know, again, if you wanted to dive into Calvin, I could give you some Calvin books, but there's just a bunch of different things happening at once. So what about the movies? Oh, um, well, well, here I stand, actually. There, there's an old black and white movie made based on the Roland Baton book um, called Here I Stand. Again, you know, Historians quibble with it, but it's a movie, so um, you know you know you're not getting in every detail right. But um, but that's a good one. It's actually a better one than the later Luther movie, um, which I, which not only gets some things wrong, but in a way that it's hard to explain. You know, like you don't know why why are you messing with that? It was a better story if you told it the right way. Um, but uh, but there is that Luther movie. I think that's just called Luther. Um, but, and it's moving and, you know, in, interesting and entertaining. It's not particularly accurate, but, um, the role in, the, the, here I stand is probably better. Um, on the rest of the Reformation, uh, there's a, there's a, a, there was a movie done about William Tyndale. I forget what it was called. I think it was a BBC movie, but I forget the name of it. Um, you could probably search around a little bit and figure, figure it out. But it, it, I recall it being pretty good. Um, th there also is a, um, a documentary series that I'm thinking documentaries now. There is a documentary on Luther that interviews a number of eminent theologians. I mentioned Carl Truman, he's in that. Um, and then Dearman McCulloch, who's a somewhat, somewhat left-leaning um, church historian from Oxford um, did a series called 3,000 Years, uh, no, no, is that right? 
called now. But anyway, it's this, it's a it goes with a book that he wrote. But it's a it's a series on the history of the church, and there's a Reformation one that's pretty interesting. You'll see some sites, and um, and he's he's an eminent historian, um, although he he has an agenda in some places. So those are those are some ones that I can think of. But I think the best ones are documentaries. Anything else? Yes, back. One more question. Sure. So I've heard many Catholics dismiss Luther uh, as someone who he just uh, was so anxious and he couldn't take the monastic discipline anymore and he wanted yeah. to fulfill his carnal yeah. you know, desires and so on. Uh, you know, it seems to me if you read Luther, that doesn't, that's hard to defend, but is that a new accusation or does that date back to his contemporaries accusing Luther of that being his true motivation? I think the psychological aspect of it is relatively new um, because it's relatively, like within the last 150 years that historians have sort of psychologized everyone that they're studying. So I don't think the psychological motivation of, oh, you know, the, there's a famous article uh, written by a professor at Harvard Divinity School, The Uneasy Conscience of Martin Luther, and it's basically saying, you know, he was just, like if Luther had had a therapist, the Reformation wouldn't have happened. Um, and, and that explanation is new and novel and, and I think doesn't hold any, any water. But, um, but the, the explanation that he was just uh, motivated by sinful desires or by a, you know, wanting power or, or, or that he was, he was sort of a closet sinner in some major way, that, that, that's not new. That was, that was stuff that was circulated back then. Matter of fact, it's interesting, um, Luther, when he was nearing death, uh, and this actually happened for most of the major reformers, when Luther was nearing death, the, his friends around him made sure that there were always two or three people with him at all times. Because they knew that if he died alone, that the Roman church would say that he recanted on his deathbed. And they needed, they needed several eyewitnesses at all times so that they could, and Luther wanted this as well, like they, he wanted people around him. To, so, that, so that they could report accurately that he went to his death believing all these things and declaring all these things to be true. And again, that wasn't just true of Luther, that was true of most of the reformers. So yeah, there were all kinds of rumors about him at that time. The particular psychologized version of, of understanding Luther is a modern <coughs> phenomenon, though. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. Yeah. Individual. Were there, like, there were lots of, we tend to look mostly also at the Protestant side. Were there key players after the fact, like during the Reformation cycle on the Catholic side, who were committed to and genuinely opposing the Reformation that were um, loud and consistent voices on that side? Um, Erasmus of Rotterdam was Luther's sparring partner. Now, Erasmus himself, honestly, in any other era, probably would have been seen as somewhat of a reformer. He was really, he really challenged a lot of church teaching on some things, but, but ultimately was going was gonna to be a party line guy, uh, but certainly an eminent scholar, and Luther's bondage of the will was a direct response to Erasmus. So Erasmus would be one. Um, there, uh, you know, later on, um, uh, uh, Cardinal Sadaletto is a, is a major uh, Council of Trent uh, kind of anti-Protestant uh, uh, cardinal, uh, um, um, and there there are others along the way, but no one, no one who has the kind of heft that that um, the the reformers do, and certainly no one that has the popularity that they do, even at their in their time. Um, you know, the council, the documents of the Council of Trent are worth consulting because they really did try to bring together sort of the best and the brightest Counter Reformation figures to, uh, to work through those things. So Trent is where you start to really see that clarified. Other 
other things. Okay. I'll hand it back. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Master. I'll just quote. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause. That was great. Um, hopefully, you all stick around for lunch. I think it's being uh, prepared right now. Um, so we look forward to a time of uh, some fellowship. And if you have any other questions for Dr. Master about uh, Greenville Seminary, he's a president of a seminary. Uh, don't forget that. So it's a good, good place to uh, consider. Um, let me pray for us and, and also uh, just for, the, for our lunch together. Our Father God, we do praise you, O Lord, King of creation and sovereign over all the details of the world, even bringing about reformation in um, the 1500s. We pray that you would continue to bring reformation in our land <clears throat> according to your word and uh, revival amongst the churches and um, growing us in faith and also those uh, who are in unbelief, uh, drawing them to yourself. So bless the preaching of your word, we pray, and we, we ask that you would use even this time that we've been learning uh, to grow us closer to you and, and uh, grow our interest in um, your work in history. We pray for our time together uh, in lunch, that you would uh, strengthen our bodies through this food and um, bless our fellowship together and encourage us in Christ, we pray. It's in his name uh, we pray. Amen. Amen.